This is Soccer 101 with Moon and Rockio. All right, all right. Welcome back to Soccer 101. A positive, all across the board positive episode of Soccer 101. Yeah, that's right. We are excited. Brock, we got a we- win. I don't think we can pull it off. I don't think we can pull off a completely positive episode. I don't. I don't think. I don't, yes, I don't know can. if we have it in a, in us. In fact, oh, I'm being yeah. negative right now, so I proved that. <gasps> oh, how dare you! Let's start it off with uh, the LA Galaxy match. Top of the West, Galaxy coming in, looking to dominate. You know, like a, I mean, somewhat of a fresh uh, St. Louis City SC squad. But dude, I, so. I, uh, I'm sure we're gonna get right into it. Um, but uh, just a little preview. We'll, we'll do the match review first, and we'll talk about. Uh, looks like Blom is headed back to uh, South Africa. We also, uh, I don't know if you read this article, but St. Louis uh, STL today had a thing, kind of an interview from Parker and how he feels about his exit. And I know we talked about that already. Not really anything new, but just a little reaction to his reaction, I guess. And then we'll get into the match preview about this weekend and a little bit of the schedule stuff. But dude, how could you not be positive when you finally see our freaking defense? Um, holding shape, looking looking composed, and making very few mistakes. And what do you freaking know? We beat the best team in the West. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was a huge game from the defense. I've been excited all week to hear your specific responses because, for me, I, I think we still – we still saw some of the of the similar issues with just spacing, I thought. But the fundamentals that help you cover for those issues was just so much better. And I think one point we made in last week's episode that I think we definitely saw continue to play out, which was just the calmness factor on the defense, and that they yes. didn't they didn't look like they were freaking out with the ball. I asked Roman Berkey about that post game. He talked about how much you know how much stability that gives him when his team is being you know better with the ball. Obviously, a big topic over the last week week two weeks has been killing the game. Anytime you can control the ball, you can help kill the game. And obviously, taking that two one lead and then and then holding it out for the win definitionally was killing the game. And just today on Thursday, John Hackworth at the city press conference was again talking about the main thing being killing the game and them needing to focus on what they did this last week when they beat LA if they take a lead against New England they have to be able to do the exact same thing and part of that was the defense not only defending better but controlling the ball better and I thought that was a huge factor and I thought Giannis uh, Giannis Horn in his first look for St. Louis City looked fantastic and I think Henry Kessler continued to look great. Kessler was great. Let's talk about the lineups. The lineup was Nerwinski, Kessler, Hebert, and Horn in the back, and then Jay Reed came in uh, for Horn and actually got an assist, which was freaking great. But, uh, dude, this was an MLS defense on the uh, on the better half of the the league. The MLS has always known has been known for just you know weak defenses. It's usually the last place uh, money is being splashed, and I want to touch on that, and that's kind of why I want to talk about Parker a little bit, because I forgot what Parker was getting paid, um, and I kind of want to mention that in just a minute, but dude, this defense looks so solid, dude. They, uh, like you said, there, there's still, uh, you know, a mistake here or there, or maybe somebody kind of losing things, but A, there was composure, I just think B, there's there a lot was of space. cover. I just want to point out, in every offensive stat, other than shots and obviously goals, which which obviously matter. Every other offensive stats, pass completed, progressive passes, touches in the opponent's uh, box, uh, passes into the final third, key passes, big chances. Pretty much every major stat, L.A. had the better of St. Louis City. But they only scored one goal, and they and both teams had 10 shots. So do you care about any of that? No. But I'm saying is there were things that happened in the periphery of the game where L.A. was controlling the ball, getting the ball in space, and was able to do things. They just they just had no ability to get that final you know, punch in the box, and that was because of City's strong play. So both of those things matter, and, but City's strong play is the bigger thing to take away. But I do want to point out why I was maybe I was pointing out the issues in space still being a factor. Yeah, I can understand that. I guess from a stat perspective, but I'm not looking at the stats. That's that's your thing. I'm I'm just watching the game, and I and I, I watched the match, and I've watched a, a, a couple replays. But that, especially that doesn't this. surprise you either. Like hearing that, hearing that, LA Galaxy doubled them up in passes. Specifically, they doubled them up in passes. Uh, you said he had mo- had less passes in their own uh, total than LA Galaxy had in City's offensive end total. So like, I mean, they they controlled the ball. And they had about, I think there was, I can't remember the exact possession number off the top of my head right now, but it was in the, it was in the 60s, uh, high 60s because Cities was in the, in, in the mid thir- limited to low 30s. So just looking at it, not even looking at the stats, did it feel like 
City was controlling that game for the most part, or did it feel like they were simply getting the final play when they needed to on their own end? I would never say that they were controlling it, but they were playing a better team that's <laughs> yes. on that's on a run, that's still playing for something. They're sure. playing for Supporter Shield. They yep. also have games in hand over LAFC, so they needed these points. They, they were, it was a big deal to get these points. Um, I would say it was a good match, and it yep. was a good game that was put on by the 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 top team in the West versus a team that honestly, had we fielded this team from the beginning of the season, we'd be top four. We'd be top four in the West. I think this is that good of a team. When you look at the bench, when you look at Durkin and Hartel in the center with, um, you know, with uh, uh, Leuven and, and the, uh, yeah, and the likes of Vasilev being able to come in and come out, Alm when he's healthy, being able to come in and come out and play some kind of different positions in there. And then you have Betcher, Torcher in the middle, who's just been super awesome and consistent. That first goal was uh, was great, and it just showed like, oh, look at this is the result of composure, of just like some basic yeah. basic play and some basic composure, and he tucks it in. It was just an excellent shot. I didn't think he was going to get a shot. I thought he was going to go with his left. And he ended up, you know, getting his own rebound and that little, um, that little tuck uh, with his with his right foot. It was beautiful. And I'm not going to say that we controlled the match, but we fairly won the match and beat the better team. And when you're talking about stats, saying that you know we didn't have as many passes, isn't that the game that you said we've been trying to play this whole like counterattacking, like not possessive? I mean, you literally last week no, you I'm, just I'm not, I'm you not, just again. backed yourself up, but in a negative way. No, but but there have been games in the past where cities played their style lost the possession battle but still was able to win certain stats like shots um touches in the in the opponent's box entries into the final third there's even been a couple of games where city outpassed teams in the in the attacking half of their of the opponent that's all i'm saying is is just but but the difference there is that inevitably there would be some colossal mistake in the in in their box, despite all those stats saying it the other way, and they would give up a goal, and it would be a two-two tie. And now the difference is that even though they did allow all those passes and a lot of possession from LA Galaxy, when the LA Galaxy actually got the ball in the box, even though again they got more, a lot more touches in the box than City did, they weren't able to do anything with those touches. And in previous games, when teams got the ball in the box, even when they were outnumbered by City's defenders, they would just walk the ball through the defense they would calmly pass it like they were doing it like they were working through practice versus their b team and they would put the ball in the back of the net and this time city looked like the composed ones when the when the ball was in their box not the offense and that's the that was the biggest difference in that game i saw well, okay, that goes to show you that so if if before we were losing the stats battle against passes of possession and that hasn't changed, but what has changed is we, we won a match and the defense looked good. It just went to show you that we never got beat by another team passing more than us or possessing more than us. We got beat because of just ridiculous lack of fundamentals and core values on the defensive line and that's why I was glad to see Parker go and I'm not saying I'm glad to see Parker go. I'm glad to see a major shift in our back line and it's already showing fruit and all they did was just seal up some basics and some fundamental well, we, play we they also, were covering for one another well i'm just saying nothing else has changed well, if we're the, still letting yes. them pass. Okay, no no something did change which is we got we got an astronomical game that no one ever would have predicted out of jake Nerwinski. i mean that's yeah, that that is that, that, that was a huge curveball that no one could have predicted going into that game now again who is the who is to blame for this be, for it taking this long for Jake Nerwinski to have this kind of game? Clearly, with the way you heard Jake Nerwinski talk in the post game press conference, he didn't feel like maybe he was getting the support he needed from the previous regime. That's not unfortunately a very uncommon thing we've really heard from players now that John Hackworth is the head coach, and and he felt very supported by Hackworth, and then he has that game against. Paintsill, who murdered the city back line the last time they played the LA Galaxy. I mean, single handedly murdered the city back line. And Jake Nerwinski is the one who shuts him down. There's not a single person on this planet who would have predicted that happening. And so I, I, I'm glad that it happened. It obviously worked out, but I also just wonder how, how repeatable that result would be. And that's why I'm looking at the stats because. It, it, for me, it's it, when you look at one game, yes, the W or the L or the draw matters. 
But what happens between the big moments that decided that game can tell you about what's going to happen the next week and the next week and the next week and the next week. It, when we, when, when, even when City had good games, Moon, you and I sat here and harped on the nine times where the other team got to walk in, walk the ball in, but it was saved gorgeously by Roman Berkey. And we told ourselves and we told our listeners, I don't care that it was saved by Roman Berkey. That play will be a goal more often than not. And we were correct about that. And so that's that's my point is I didn't mean I didn't want to focus on something negative. I was just <laughs> saying here's the full scope of what happened. It was a 2-1 victory. Here's all the very good, and there was a lot of very good, and here's the things that weren't perfect because, again, it wasn't a perfect game. It never will be. That's that's all I'm saying with pointing these numbers out because they they aren't congruent to what happened. When when City gets beat in these offensive categories by this margin, because, they usually, again, you're correct, they don't usually win these categories, but it's by the margin with which they were defeat, beaten – where usually that game plays out to a 3-1 loss or a 2-2 draw, not a 2-1 uh, win. The difference there, moving from stats to tape, is the calmness from the defense. And and I also want to say, early on in the first half, the ingenuity from the coaching staff in the technical arrangement of City. I tweeted about it during the first goal. You saw it throughout the first half. It was less so in the second half, and it was more so the players locking in and playing their fundamental game that closed the game. But what opened the game and got City into the game was an ingenuity from the coaching staff with, with their tactics. Obviously, starting Jake Nerwinski was part of it, but the other part was just what they were doing with Jake Nerwinski, which is Jake Nerwinski essentially, and, and this isn't rare, we've talked about this before with different formations, Jake Nerwinski, one example, played three different positions in that game. And he played essentially two different positions in the first half and a third position in the second half. And what I'm talking about is in the first half, Jake Nerwinski played right center back and right wing back, but he very rarely played as a right back. Because they were they, they came out in their four two three one, but the entire first half, especially bef- around the first goal, they were shifting from a back three to a back five, and Nerwinski was playing both right center back, or he was playing right wing back, and and he was either playing right wing back when Leuven or Durkin would drop into the back line, which we talked about last week, or he was the right center back when Indy Vasilev was then dropping back to be the right wing back, which made a lot of sense to give him the start over Thor if you're going to do that in the first half. That's one of the reasons they made those changes. And so, and then in the second half, they stopped switching the formation around. They kept it more to their four two three one with a little bit of their four two four in uh, non possession when they're pressing. And Nerwinski then played right back the entire time and did all the defensive things he did the first half just in a slightly different position. But I, 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 it's a fascinating way that when you go back and look at that, that game, multiple players played multiple roles in multiple positions across the game while essentially playing with these same 11 guys. And it, it, it was one of the best games that shows how formations – can be used with inside a system that is being dic- that that is dictating that formation, and I thought that was a perfect example, especially in the first half. But then in the second half, they didn't get all crazy with it. But you saw the team lock down and and lean on their players to focus on the fundamentals and win that game, and that's exactly what they did. Leaning on players—that's what I want to respond to, and I think Nowinski and all of them, and Berkey included, all benefited from. These guys look like they really had one another's backs. They really understood how to cover, how to move, how to shift, you know, uh, positions and roles, like you're saying. And I think the biggest difference between this, what we saw in in this match, and the other ones, you know, to respond to what you were talking about, Berkey having to save people from walking in. You are, pardon me. You were mentioning Nerwinski's um, performances from before and how he said he didn't feel supported, dude. If you feel alone back there and the right there's there's no communication or there's not the right communication from your back. He wasn't line talking about assistant. he wasn't talking about on the field. He was I know that. I, yeah. I know. He, he was talking about not feeling supported. I think as a player and in, in, in the locker room. I know that, but I'm I'm responding and saying like it, you could see it on the field. This yeah, team, no. I wouldn't say that they looked disjointed, but they looked like. You know, like, what's what's the most – when do you make your most mistakes? It's when you're, like, on your back foot. And I mean in life. You know, it's when you feel alone and unsupported and you're reacting. When you're, you have to think when cho- you have to think too much. When, when, you, yeah, yeah, when, you're, when you're not just doing it. And when your choices are based on re- a reactiveness and you feel alone in your reactiveness, you usually make un- uneducated decisions, poor decisions, mm-hmm. poor choices. And it seemed like every one of those times – and you could go back the last ten matches besides the Galaxy one – when and when a defender 
was under attack in some way, just go look at them. They look like they feel alone and reacted as if they were alone. And it was even if it was one on ones or, or, or whatever. I mean, you saw a lot of mistakes being made because these Dudes did not look like they felt supported. Now, I know I'm getting a little deep with psychology, and no one's going to go back and watch for that kind of crap. Really but, I mean, but but one of the differences that, that I saw, dude, just just go watch the six-minute recap or, or wherever you can find it. You're going to see a defense that, like, either is just always holding its shape or loses a little bit, and somebody's covering, somebody's covering, somebody's covering. It was constant movement, and the only time anybody gave up a step, Galaxy got a goal. I believe it was Hebert, and he was with he was with the dude. Um, on the run, and it was kind of a, a, yeah, a give was... and go. And he he just gave him a half a step. If he had stayed with him, he may have had it, but he just gave up a half a step, and it, and it cost us a goal. Now I'm not saying screw you, Hebert. This is a giant mistake on Hebert, but that's literally the only time I didn't see somebody like on it. And 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 again, you know, you give me crap because I'm always comparing these guys to world class players, and you know, some of them aren't world class players necessarily. Uh, that's not what I'm expecting, and, I'm, and I always articulate that poorly. But what I'm saying is, like, dude, this was great play. Yep. Great play, is, especially from what we considered, uh, you know, the second season to be a, a, a steep learning curve and, and a lot of changes. I'm so happy with the staff and the changes that they've made. So let's move on from that match. Um, oh, Also, uh, again, a huge shout-out. I'm glad you mentioned Nerwin, Nerwinski because he was the genesis of that first goal. Um, I don't think he got credited with an assist because it went to, to through two or three people before yeah, it got the yeah, catchers. Yeah, because Besher might have gotten it. Yeah, you're 100 right, and that that but was that's a great example. Started that. Yeah, and that's a great example because that that goal happens around like the ninth minute. In the first like six or seven minutes, he was mainly playing like the third center back in in that in that kind of shifting formations they were running. But in that play, right before the goal happens, they shifted from him being that third center back to it being one of the midfielders. He steps yeah. up in, into the right wing back spot. And so he's all the way up on the other side of midfield when he wins that ball and creates the goal. You're hundred percent correct. Yeah. Nerwinski was the genesis of that goal. Yep. And, and, and that uh, coupled with the very first kickoff, the whistle goes, it's city's possession. What do they do? They don't kick it back like typically, you know. Oh to, man, to, I to forgot to shape. ask about they that. Went, Damn. They went straight forward oh, and they said they for basically said from second point five. I hate five, you so much for bringing that up right now. Hey, hey, God Galaxy, we're here to attack and we are not gonna allow you. I am to so, run us. I'm so angry at myself, Moon. I meant to ask Hackworth in the post game about. The opening kickoff, and if it's a new thing, where they're, they're running a set play, because I, I can't remember who it was. In the, a guy in the Premier League, a team in the Premier League, I think last year made a couple headlines because they got like two goals because they ran like a very specific set play off of the opening kickoff, and the and the coach gave a brilliant description. He was like, "Listen." There's not a lot of times in soccer where we can sit there and say we know where the ball is going to be, we know where the defenders are going to be, we know where the attacker is going to be. And he's like, it's set pieces, and 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 we work on those all day to try to get goals out of them. Well, why not take one of the other times in the game where we know where everyone's going to be and build something from there? So I I don't yeah. I'm not 100 percent sure what the plan was or how how articulated the plan was or if it was just get forward. But I forgot to ask Hackworth post game. I forgot to ask him today on Thursday. I'm really mad. I if they do it again. I'm having to ask about that moon because I'm 100% with you. I loved I love that we saw that right out the start in the ga right out the the gate to start the game. Loved that so much. Like I said, this this coaching staff is doing some things that really got me on their side. Yeah, dude, that was a cool move and I noticed it immediately. The very first thing I thought was and I didn't even think about I love that you brought that uh that Premier League coach up I can't uh, for who it saying was. that. If anyone because knows, I, I, please let me know. I'm I think excited it was last to year. I'm excited to hear you uh, uh, talk to Hackworth about that and see what he says and see if he like it was is even um, forthcoming about it. But uh, honestly, whether it was a design play or not, I I'll have to 100% assume that it was a directive from a coach and yeah. it was a, and, a, and it was a signal. I just want to know how team. specific it was. Was it right. just or, or, everyone get forward, uh, or was it a, yeah. was it like, hey, listen, Hartle, I want you here on the left. You're gonna get forward. You're gonna drag this defender here. Then we're gonna have Reed. We're gonna have Hannes cross over. Like, I want to know exactly how specific the play design was, or if it was more just a general, hey, we're gonna get the ball and get forward to start the game and see what happens. 
Yeah, it was a signal, and it was a signal to the fans too. And I, I received the signal. and was very excited. Absolutely. I was like, uh, you know, it was, it was just a glimmer of like, yeah, screw you guys, we're going for it. Yeah, I like that. But um, and, and, and let's let's uh, roll on here. The the Revolution game. I got a couple quick points to talk about. Uh, you want to go to the Revolution game? Yeah, because uh, well, just just some training notes from this week that that. Uh, came out of, of the press conference just a few hours ago, talking to John Hackworth earlier today. One of the big things that jumped out um, was he said that right now there's four positions where the battle is really tough on the depth chart. And I put that out on Twitter, and everyone had a qu- very quick consensus, and I think most people are right about what four positions those are. Moon, you might disagree with us, but it, it, I agree with everybody else there. It seems like that discussion is around the right Right outside midi, right winger, uh, striker, and then the two fullback spots. And the question specific, the, the answer specifically about the four positions being up for grabs was right after he was asked about the fullback spots. And so I think it's safe to say that the fullback spots right now are being fought over. And I think the right wing spot, considering you have Indy, you have Thor, now you have Alm in there. And then, of course, with how well Besher played, with Klaus coming back, I think that would probably be the fourth spot that Hackworth would be alluding to disagree or agree on those four positions? Oh, man. Yeah, I guess so. Right I mean, back's kind of was... crazy, but may, I, I'm, I'm wondering maybe is he talking about the, the other center back spot until Nielsen's healthy? But then again, I just think Hebert's played so well. I can't imagine. Again, Yarrow's played better this year. I can't imagine, though, that – there's a there's there's still a chance that that Yara would get a start over Hebert right now no. at that center yeah, back spot. And so I'm 100 percent sure on the left back spot, with with just the way that Besher's played, I'm gonna say that it's Klaus and Besher at the striker spot fighting it out. Right, I'm also very confident with the right wing spot. Alm, Thor, Indy, a lot of bodies there. But I don't know about the fourth one because it it just seems crazy to me. With I know that Norwinski played great. And I know that the reason he was in there is because Tots had has had had some rough games, but it just shocks me with how consistent Totland has been up until mid-August that he's fighting for that that he's fighting a battle for his spot. But but maybe that's the fourth spot. You know, I bet you Totland does not get. Um. Well, you know what? What a great problem, dude. Yeah, what, you're what right. A, that's 100. What? A, look at you, th- th- Mr. Po- th- Mr. Positivity of the game. Yeah, man. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm so it. positive. Think, think. I mean, think of the think of the two goals in Galaxy. Uh, uh, Jay Reed came in for Horn. Yep. Jay Reed got got the assist there. Nowinski was the genesis uh, for the first goal. So, like, obviously, key components to goal scoring, and our midfielders are the ones that are scoring. Uh, yeah. to, uh, Toychert and Hartel. Um, I'm gonna say. Honestly, dude, and this is what made me think of it, because when you when you have somebody like Thorson coming in, uh, and you have somebody like Alm, that this uh, you know a great a great utility player, and now a solid midfield, we have the greatest problem ever, talking about oh you know like battling for positions. Yep. I mean, think of the difference from two months ago. Just think about how training, just the the mindset of training, and just that drive. It's it's completely different. It's I I 100% buy into iron sharpens iron. And if you have you know if you have a 22 man deep, if you have if you're 22 deep, that makes all that makes your starting 11 better because they're being pushed by someone behind them every single day in practice. And I I firmly believe that 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 mentality is one of the reasons we've seen such strong play from City over the last month. I would hate to be Tottenham right now because you're sitting on the bench. Hoping that the team does really well, but if the team continues to do well without him, he's going to have a really hard time getting back up in there. And, um, he, and that's true, but at the same time, and I asked Hackworth about this, and I I, I don't think I asked him the best uh, version of this question, so maybe that's not what I got the answer I want. I got a, a great answer from him about kind of how they decide formations, which is they they look at the, they they break the team down first, they figure out their tactics. Then they think about their personnel and their system, and then usually formation is one of the last things that kind of comes from, you know, they think about all their principles, then they think about what the team does that they're facing, and then the formation comes from that. And so we've talked a lot about if we're going to see a different defense, a back five again. I talked about it despite the fact that they started a 4-2-3-1. If you watch the first half, they played a lot, a lot of odd man back line. And so I wonder if we do see a game where – they, they, they throw caution to the wind and say, right now, five of our best 11 players 
are are that defensive depth. And so we're going to play Horn, Reed, Kessler, Nowinski, and Totland as a back five. I wouldn't oh, wow. I, I wouldn't hate that. They'd have a lot of movement. You could switch things around. You could drop Horn. You could play um, Reed in an overlap that the, that the defense wouldn't be suspecting because Reed's a nominal center back in this formation. Like I think you could do a lot of crazy things. Uh, I talked to Kessler today about how uh, strong and, and comfortable he feels as an outlet passer from the back line, and he, and he, and he talked about how in the LA Galaxy you can see him throw a couple line-cutting passes that, that – found their mark and, and opened things up really well. So, I mean, I, I like what they can do. I'm not saying they're going to do that or I think they should do that. The bottom line is they have options, Moon, just what you're talking about. And that's just so much more fun than what we were talking about in mid-June with this team when we were trying to cobble together a, an 11 that made sense in an MLS game. Yeah, I got two things then, um, and I don't want to go too long with this, but so you were talking about the complexity of they played two different halves with with two different formations and all that against yeah. the Galaxy. When when would and would it be wise to be shifting up and trying a five back like that, or and and if so, when I think it depends on who you play and do you do something like that against the crappy Revolution that's coming up on Saturday? Well, I I, I think if you watch that first half, I think the the shifting formations contributed to that first goal because again, I don't think. Specifically, talking about that Norwinsky interception that jumps things so high in the line, I think him shifting from playing so deep as a third center back to then all of a sudden being a, a right wing back and being in your attacking half, I think it puts players in spots that the defense doesn't expect. I don't think the defender expected Norwinsky to be right there on his ass to win that ball and, and, as you say, be the genesis of that first goal. And so I think changing formations is a way to get a jump on a team. And I think that's why you saw it more in the first half than the second half when the game had, had stratified and slowed down a little bit more so than it was in the first half and you were, you were tied 1-1 or you were up 2-1. Um, and so I think it, it's a useful tactic to use early in games to feel out the opponent, to give them looks they're not expecting from you. Maybe you jump out there, get a lead early, and then you, you settle back into what you're more – used to one thing i did get out of john hackworth uh today is asking him okay you ev- everything over the last two weeks has been about killing games how do you guys decide between killing games in a more conservative factor where it's let's stop them from scoring a goal versus a more aggressive factor where it's let's go score another one to put a nail in the coffin and he gave me a really great answer it's very long uh, I'm not, I'm not going to try to paraphrase uh, and, and, and screw up the quote. I will say the one part that stuck out to me was him saying, you have to do things the way your system and your team dictates is it's best at. And so he said, we're not ever really going to play conservative. And I, 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 I like that answer from him, and I think it, it that's why I think we're, we've seen so many different things. One thing specifically, this isn't exactly what you asked about, but you go back and you look at some of the – numbers that came out of that LA Galaxy game. We've talked a lot, Moon, in, in this whole time that I've been on the show over the last year plus. One of the biggest things City does is they build up on the left side. Edward Leuven, uh, whoever the left back is, whoever the left winger is, they they are a huge part of City's offense. We've talked about how so much of their offense is through the left side. Well, against the LA Galaxy, it was the majority of the offense um, when it came to passes into the final third and passes in the final third was on the right side, sixty over 60% in both cases, was on the right side. I don't know if we've ever seen that from City. And so for them to also just come out against one of the best teams in the game and say, here's a curveball for you. We're going to put Edward Leuven on the right side sometimes when you guys don't expect it. And that's going to create the most right-side heavy attack we've ever seen from City. And I think that's one of the reasons they were able to create so much against a team that on paper is so much better than them in the Galaxy is because they gave them things they weren't they weren't ready for and I don't care if the revolution are the worst team in the league or if they were the best team in the league you have to have three points so so do the same thing come out with something different in the first half show them some different formations then whatever is going to work whatever you have to settle into in the second half to kill this game do that the way that Hackworth and company were talking their expectation this weekend is to take a lead and then kill that lead in the second half just like they did against the Galaxy and walk away with three points. That is their expectation. That is their plan. And I think we'll see a similar plan where they get a little bit crazier in the first half and then lock it down to win it in the second half. 
Yeah, they're definitely very, being very successful as tacticians. The revolution has not been good. Now, they just got uh, kind of run over by um, Real Salt Lake. Real Salt Lake has had a great run recently. They're in good form. Uh, revolution, this is going to be an interesting match because it is away, so it is up in New England. And they have Tim Parker, who we sent a pack in not long ago. You know, he was going to become a free agent at the end of the year. Now, uh, like I said, STL Today has a great article, interviewed him. Um, you know, the only news that I think we should even just mention with it is, you know, he was talking about how disappointed he was and how they – had some negotiations, and he wanted to feel, what was it, more valued or something like that, but they just didn't, you know, work the deal. They, they didn't want to give him what he wanted, and what he wanted was some commitment. Term. Um, long-term, yeah, long-term commitment. And honestly, this past weekend against the Galaxy, it was two huge wins for me, and I think for this city and for this club and for the history of it so far, even though we're brand, you know, near a brand-new club. We had two wins. We had three points. We had a win right there, and we had a win from our staff, from the office, that has completely flipped this team, and I think, I think they sent the right people packing, and I, sent, I think that they made the right decisions on who they brought in. Now, that's not a slight to Parker. A lot of people think I hate Parker. I, I love Parker. I, I, you know, he's the trivia question of all trivia questions for St. Louis sports now. And I, love, I, I, and I hope he does really well at Revolution. But the fact of the matter is the guy was making a million dollars. He was making a lot for Houston. Season, for Houston season. was paying a big chunk of it still. I understand that, but he was one of the highest paid players, and to get that off of the roster and to have Revolution pick that up, plus he's one of the older ones, 31, and just wasn't performing well. Now, wasn't performing well individually and yeah, in the system. It was a great trade. And, and they did. It was one of the best trades. So I, I, mean, I, I mean, you can't. Like, it was it, so it, good. It was funny because I, I got a tweet when that trade happened, and somebody says, can you explain this tweet to me in – uh, baseball terms, so I, this trade to me in baseball terms, so I can understand it better. I'm like, I don't need to change this to baseball terms to understand it better. You traded a 31 year old for a 26 year old at the same position. The 26 year old has a long term contract, and the 31 year old was hitting free agency. And the 26 year old is just as good of a player and might fit your scheme even better. It's like I don't need to put this in baseball terms. This just sports terms. This is a fantastic trade in every like not every single sport. That paragraph describes a really good trade. It doesn't matter what sport yeah. it is. And we could be playing in, tit- we could be playing tiddlywinks professionally and that would still be a fantastic trade. In two matches Kessler has shown to be better in the system, costs us less, more potential upside for long term and and we got to get something while the guy's still under contract. Otherwise, we get nothing when he walks because we don't want him anyway. So, like, dude, this was that was the beginning of so many good confirmations of good decisions from Fantasteel, uh, Fantasteel, and and everybody else. And it's just a, a huge win. It just shows, like, dude, this team is a great team. We're talking about, uh, you know, should we start Thorison or uh, or. Uh, um, Oh, you know, Betcher um, or Klaus, yeah, right? like, or all um, Like, I mean, we, we've got five names vying for two to three positions, all of which are good freaking players, dude. We've got a good team. I'm so happy. This was such a, a weight off my shoulders this last weekend. Um, now, I do feel bad because Parker in, in the article mentioned that, uh, you know, he's living in an apartment by himself up in New England. Yeah, His sucks. family is still here. That sucks. So he's, he's been back visiting. So if some of you have uh, seen him out there, yes, it is him. He even said, like, people look at him like, what is he? What are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> not, you're not Tim Parker, are you? Um, but I love the guy. I hope he does well. I've never met him. I don't think. I I, I don't uh, I, I don't know him. He, so when a, I say when I say I'm glad he's gone, I am from like a fan, you know, Strictly business a soccer perspective. It's just it's a soccer thing, guys. It's like I, if I can compartmentalize, so can you. Yep. Uh, we, well wishes to him. Also, well wishes to Blom. Uh, he was sent away on loan uh, back to the South African Premiership. He's at uh, Kaiser Chiefs FC uh, through June 2025. Um, I, I I wish him well, and I hope he gets more minutes. I, I think he, he, he wasn't, gonna, especially because we're pretty stacked right now, I don't think he was going to get the minutes that he deserves, well, and he's he's still a young, good player that um, needs to do something. It's one spot where they are still pretty light. The one reason that I mean, good for Blum, I, I wanted I want him to get more minutes. He obviously wasn't um, maybe he wasn't feeling the love and the appreciation uh, since the since the change uh, and just really just, you know, he, I mean, he lost a starting spot after being a really good player for you last year when he brought in Chris Dirk and that was always going to be a, a rough thing and 
how he handled that was always going to be very determinant on, on what happened here with his future. The, the positive here for me is it gets Jake Girdwood Reich maybe number you know number two on the depth chart of position. Uh, and if yeah. na- if that's not the case, maybe we might actually see Jose Kojima play his natural position of central midfield, which he has played for one appearance for like nine minutes. I want to say uh, out of his ten appearances this year, he's played his natural position one time. Um, yeah, so maybe we, we see a little Jose options. Kojima um, at, at his natural spot at, at, at late in the game as a as a Durkin or Leuven substitution because that is the one spot where you don't have a lot of depth on this team now is your center midi spots. But I'm not really worried about that because you, that's also one of your most rock solid spots. We just talked about four positions being up uh, being up in the air. Well, two of them are in the attack, two of them are in the defense. Neither of them are in the central midfield because we know what Durkin and Leuven are all about in those spots. Moon, before we wrap this up, I don't want. To get a prediction from you from the lineup yet, but I do want to get a general idea from you. If you were John Hackworth, and if you if you had to make a prediction right now, would you roll with the same lineup, or would you take this opportunity and make a, a, a few changes, maybe across those positions where those position battles are happening so intense intensely right now? Um, I would probably make one or two. But not in the backfield. I would start that same backfield. Nowinski, okay. Kessler, Hebert, well, and Horn. Hold and, back and hold hold back your offensive changes and we'll make a post on Saturday morning, a little graphic with Moon's projected starting eleven. You'll see the back four there, but what will Moon cha- what changes will Moon make on the offensive side? We'll see on Saturday morning. Yeah, it'll be it, it it'll be it'll be fun and I think I might uh, be different than yours. Okay, uh, I'm excited let's, to let's see. Just say that. What about score prediction? We got to put a score prediction now, dude. They're getting three points. They're walking away with a win here. I like the confidence coming from City today. When I heard them talk, I'm gonna go with a three-two win because I think they're gonna get a win, but a little too a little too happy. With the Galaxy victory, I think they're going to make us all, give us all a little bit of a heart attack. Game's going to get tied 2 2, and then they're going to leg one out for a 3 2 victory late. I'm going to go 3 2 for three points. I think the total opposite. I think the defense finally has its crap together. It's supporting one another, and I think that changes everything. The one plus one equals three when that kind of stuff is hitting. Uh, you know, when Berkey feels like the defense is supporting him, he's he's even more of an all-star. When, when the defense, dude, when the defense is on and they're communicating, they start getting assists and they start pushing up and they they start uh, goal scoring opportunities. And I don't care what the stats say at the end of it, passes, possession, this or that. St. Louis is walking away with us with a shutout, three to one. <laughs> Heck is the points. last time they had a clean sheet? Uh, I don't. Again, throw the stats out. I don't talk stats. That's <laughs> I go against it all and say we are riding high on the drug of positivity. And Should they beat uh, Dallas 2-0 in the league's cup. Three nothing. Three nothing. The was Revolution are total garbage. I don't know if Parker's going to start or if he's even going to get some minutes there. But either way, the Revolution is in shambles, and St. Louis no longer is. This is a freaking okay, solid so team the with last great talent. Time that St. Louis City both got a clean sheet and a win in MLS play this season was 2-0 versus the Earthquakes back on July 3rd. I don't count that game because the Earthquakes aren't a real team. So we're going to go all the (laughs) way back to to 2-0 against New York City FC was a home win. So I don't know if we can count that one because it's a a home game. Um, uh, Let's see, shutouts here. Um, away in a win. They got Dallas 0-0, Dynamo 0-0, Portland Timbers 0-0. So we're looking at five clean sheets in MLS play this season. Three of them have been draws. Two of them have been wins. But the last one against a real team was the second game of the season. So don't matter. I'd love don't to matter. see it. I, I, don't think, hey, this, I, don't this, think, I don't think it's going to happen. But, again, this the is positivity a, from Moon today. Wow. This is a fresh team that's starting to gel, I mean, and and they they they're going to get wire, their mojo. Positivity. They're going to get their myself. mojo. This is this is needed. This is a needed time. I mean, there's you know they're still not mathematically uh, counted out here, so like everything matters. I think they are ready to freaking show that they deserve a better position than 13th in yeah. the West or whatever we are. I I, I mean, if Mo- if the city's defense is anywhere as consistent as Moon has been on this podcast, 
They are 100% <laughs> getting a clean sheet. The man went wire to wire positivity. He started off the show and said, we're going to be positive, and I tried to rattle him multiple times. I sent in crosses early. I sent in crosses low. I tried to I, I tried to put the ball through the middle of the field. It didn't matter. The wire to wire positivity for Moon in this podcast, the man is unflappable, and if City's defense is anything like Moon, City's walking away with three points on Saturday. Wow, Moon, what a performance today in the podcast. How about you? Thank you. Great job. Great job, St. Louis City SC. On the field and off the field, in the office, I'm proud of you. You're coming home from New England with a 3 nothing shutout and three points. Three big goals.